I didn't want to be an astronaut. What I wanted was to fly the space shuttle. So I saw a launch of a shuttle and I thought to myself, well, I'd love to drive that. From EE Tech Media, this is Moore's Lobby, where engineers gather to talk all about circuits. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff. You are in for a treat. During Industry Tech Days last week, we had a live session that I just have to share with you. I don't want to keep you waiting, so let's just jump right to it. Here's that interview live from Industry Tech Days 2021. If I told you that someone had traveled 250 miles, you probably wouldn't be that impressed. But if I told you that it's 250 miles vertically, straight up into space, and then they docked with a $150 billion pressure chamber floating at 17,000 miles an hour, I hope that would get your attention. Colonel Mike Hopkins and Commander Victor Glover Jr. can make that claim, and they are here today. They were both part of the historic first crewed flight of a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft that launched in 2021 and just got back to Earth in May. This is one of their first interviews since they got back, and even though they are here back on terra firma, I have to say this session is going to be out of this world. Victor, Mike, thank you so much for being here. Can you introduce yourself and tell everyone how you got started as an astronaut? I'm uh, Colonel Colonel Mike Hopkins, uh, U.S. Space Force, uh, previously of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, so I, I joined NASA in 2009. It was after uh, four tries over the course of 13 years and then was finally selected and, and was privileged to join the 2009 class. Um, I do have flight test in my background as a flight test engineer. And, um, and so, again, I spent uh, most of my Air Force career doing that, then selected by NASA had the, uh, the privilege of flying as part of Expedition 37 and 38 back in 2013, 2014 on the Soyuz. And then again, most recently, this mission on uh, Crew Dragon as part of Crew 1 and Expedition 64 and 65. And I am Navy Commander Victor Glover, a NASA astronaut. And I joined the Astronaut Corps in 2013 uh, after being a, a naval aviator and test pilot I was fortunate to fly the F-18 Hornet and the Super Hornet and the Growler a little bit in test and really enjoyed those things. I flew uh, in combat in Operation Iraqi Freedom and I was uh, working in Congress. I was able to do something a little different. Instead of working in the Pentagon, I opted for a staff job working for a senator. And so got to work in Congress for a year. And I was actually nine months into that uh, fellowship when I, I got the call to uh, come down to Houston to start astronaut candidate training. And so I've been here since 2013, uh, part of the eight balls, eight uh, uh, candidates selected, four men, four women, uh, and uh, most of our class is flown. And we've got a couple people in the hopper to fly, ha, huh? in the hopper, getting ready to fly uh, soon. Uh, things go well. And, uh, and it's been a really interesting eight years. Actually, uh, the day after tomorrow is the eight year anniversary of when I started working at NASA. Fantastic. And Victor, how did you know that you wanted to be an astronaut? Well, good question. So there's a little nuance here. And, and actually, it started, I didn't want to be an astronaut. What I wanted was to fly the space shuttle. So I saw a launch of a shuttle. And I can't tell you exactly when it was, what mission. I, I was about 10 years old. And I saw it on television. And I thought to myself, well, I'd love to drive that. I wanted to be a race car driver, stunt man, a police officer like my father. And so you can, yeah, I, I, I've always had a, a maybe an extra sensitive sense of uh, adventure. And I wanted to do all those things. And I saw a shuttle launch on TV and thought, actually, the, the, the thought was I'd love to drive that thing. I didn't even know pilots and enough to think that you had to be a pilot or to be an astronaut. But I just thought I want to control that machine. And so that's where it began. And, you know, that that grew with me over the years, learning about aviation and engineering. And I actually was on my way to becoming a test pilot. I was in test pilot school and I saw Pam Melroy, who's now our deputy administrator. I saw her give a talk about her mission. And I thought, you know what? I am throwing my hat in that ring. It was very motivating listening to her talk about not just the technology and the operations, but the, the respect and the camaraderie uh, of their crew 
I really thought that's something I could, you know, toss my hat in the ring for and, and see what happens. And so I actually applied for, for Hopper's class in 2009 or started in 2007 and, uh, and, and didn't get anywhere in that one. And then I applied for the next round in 2013 and, and, uh, every dog has his day. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned being a, a fighter pilot and you probably know what I'm going to ask, but can you tell us about your call sign and how, how that came to be? <laughs> uh, it's a long story. I'll say this. I earned it. Um, I had, you know, I can be opinionated. And so, uh, you know, I showed up to my new squadron and, and, uh, it was no, uh, it wasn't surprising to anybody when my commanding officer, we have these really cool ceremonies that are a lot of fun. We call them call sign review boards. It's a tradition in uh, aviation and most of the flying services, Air Force does them, Navy, Marine Corps. And, uh, and, and so, it's usually run by the younger officers, though. And so it's really interesting that my commanding officer gets up and he, you know, there's all these other options on the board. And, and he goes up and he puts I-T-I-K-E. And then he goes and sits down. And, and so everybody, all the other junior officers are like, uh, you want to explain that one, sir? And he says, I think I know everything. Questions? And so, and we voted and it was unanimous. Everybody uh, agreed that was going to be it. And uh, so, and that ceremony was run by the senior junior officer uh, and, and a, a good friend of mine. He, and he goes, uh, well, you know, Skipper, I think, you know, for, for uh, brevity's sake, we'll shorten it to Ike. So I-K-E is what it actually wound up being officially. I know everything, uh, but it's a reminder to, uh, you know, to, keep my opinions to myself when I can. <laughs> <laughs> so is it flattering or is it kind of like an, uh, obviously not embarrassing, but do, are you proud of that? Or is it something that is like, well, this is the moniker that I now have. Oh, it, well, it's, it's, it's a lot of things. It's, I, I think it's not so much whether it's flattering or not, because they're, you know, call signs are generally some form of, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, one of the ways that we get the outcome we want in, in the fleet, you know, it's a, it's a part of training, if you will. It's not F-18 training, but it's like cultural training. This is the culture we want, and we're going to use every tool we have to get it. But also, you know, I've had it now since uh, that squadron I joined in 2003. So I, I showed up and my call sign was Rubber, Rubber Glover, just based on my last name. And and so, you know, I think that whatever call sign you get after you've we have actually we, we 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 jokingly say any call sign you take into combat with you is yours forever. And so I did go into combat in that squadron and I took that one with me. So it's obviously special to me. Uh, but you know what? It doesn't matter if they called me, uh, you know, uh, uh, they could have called me whatever. They, they could have keep kept calling me Rubber Glover. But when they paint that name on the side of a jet and uh, you get to fly a jet that has your name painted on one side, I mean, that's pretty amazing. So any any call sign that people are going to use because you're you know you're flying squadron mates with them, I think it, uh, it you're you're doing pretty well. <laughs> there are worse things that makes sense. than having a bad call sign. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, I love that we have Mike and Ike here as the <laughs> as the dynamic duo. Today's keynote is brought to you by Avnet. Avnet is a leading distributor of electronic components that has serviced the electronics industry since 1921. Avnet works as an extension of your team to help you accelerate your design and scale operations as you move into production and extend your product throughout its life cycle. For more information, visit avnet.com. And now back to our interview with astronauts, Colonel Mike Hopkins and Commander Victor Glover Jr. Uh, Mike, how about you? How did you know you said you tried a couple times to become an astronaut and it didn't pan out for you. What made you keep going? Why is this something that was something you chased after? Yeah, well, so for me, it started, uh, so I mentioned that he was uh, watching a launch when he was 10 years old. Well, I was in high school. then. <laughs> I was finishing up high school at that point. So, uh, But watching those launches, watching those shuttle missions, and this is the early days of the shuttle that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, you know, at that time, they used to actually, you know, bring a lot of the kids into the auditorium at school. And, and you know, I'd be that old TV, the old cathode ray tube TV, as big as they could get it. And they would they would show the launches and like the spacewalks and things of that nature. And 
uh, you know, kind of like I, he, he says, I want to drive that. And, and for me, it was one of the, I want to do that. I want to do that mission. That looks, that yeah. just looks like something I would, uh, I would like to do something that uh, would be very fulfilling to, to be able to do. And so it just, from that point on, it kind of stuck as a, as a long-term goal. Um, and then you have to kind of figure out what am I going to do in between? Because there is a, there is an in between, uh, there is something that, that you have to figure out what you want to do in the interim. And, and in fact, it's most likely for, for most people is something that you're going to end up doing for the rest of your life. Because I think Victor and I would both say we're very fortunate to have uh, gotten this job. And so for me, I, I was also interested in aviation though, and, and went into aerospace engineering, uh, got into the flight test, as I mentioned as well. And so throughout that whole time, I was, I'm absolutely loving what I'm doing in the air force, getting to, to test airplanes and flying airplanes. And at the same time, I kept pursuing this goal of, of becoming an astronaut and, and just, uh, you know, I was very fortunate that it finally worked out. So you were, you both did a lot of work testing, uh, testing planes before you were astronauts. Can you talk about and compare pulling a lot of G's to effectively pulling zero G's in space? How that's different and how that's maybe the same. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll let Ike start with that one since uh, he's probably pulled a lot more G's than I have throughout his career. Well, you know, I, I uh, have been fortunate. I just uh, got back off a of vacation and drove to California to visit a lot of family. And so, you know what question I was asked a lot? What launch felt like in pulling those G's? And so it's interesting that, um, you know, the most G's I've ever pulled in my life is in a centrifuge training. And we did a centrifuge that ma matched our uh, profiles on ascent and entry. And so that was great exposure. Um, but but, you know, the, the most G's I pulled operationally were in, in a fighter aircraft, eight, nine G's. But that's only for a few seconds. And so, you know, first, before you can live in weightlessness and be in a zero G environment, you have to go through high G's to get there uh, because you have to get to, to such a high speed to hit orbital velocity. And so our launch, you know, was was roughly 10 minutes of accelerating, starting from straight up. And then once the rocket tipped over and the upper stage tip over, that's when you really just start, you know, accelerating. And we were above three G's for minutes. We were above four G's for, for several seconds, maybe even a couple minutes. And we peaked out just mm -hmm. under four and a half G's. And what was the most impressive about that? While I pulled more G, uh, I've never pulled a significant amount of G for, for roughly 10 minutes. And so uh, at staging, when the rocket, the first stage comes, turns off and disconnects, flies back and to the land on the ship. And then at uh, second stage engine cutoff, uh, other than that, you're accelerating the whole time. And that was really impressive. I mean, it, it, there was so much power right there behind us uh, that it was amazing. In entry, it was the same thing in reverse. You felt those same forces because our spacecraft turns around. On entry, we're facing into the wind. On, uh, I'm sorry, on launch, we're facing the wind. On entry, we're backwards. So the G-forces feel the same. They make your face do this both times, and that was just amazing. And then between those two, for 167 days, we lived in on the space station in microgravity. And for me, it was the first time I got to experience that. So from the first moment in, in Dragon, inside Resilience, to every day, uh, it's amazing. I tell you what, there's nothing that prepares you for going to sleep and then waking up, and in, in both in weightlessness. I mean, to live in weightlessness and work in weightlessness is was truly uh, an amazing life experience. And I'll let Hopper talk more about that if he wants to. Yeah, I you know, I, he describes the what it was like, those sustained Gs and all of that. And, and I, the one thing I'll say about that, though, is we can relate to that. Um, even though it was different, uh, both of us have experienced Gs in, in uh, the fighters before. And so you know what you kind of expect. But what I will say is zero G, we don't have any reference for that. I mean, it's just it is so unique and, and it's just hard to get your, your mind around it when, when you finally get up there and you experience sustained G's. There's nothing, there's no reference point for us down here on earth. You know, it's not like we, we train in the pool, for example, for spacewalks and, and that works pretty well, but you still know G is there, right? You're still feeling earth's gravity because if you flip upside down, you feel the blood rushing to your head, all of that. So so being up there and living in zero G, it's not like swimming in the pool. It's not like flying. Um, it's, you know, a bird or anything of that nature. It's different and it's hard to explain. And that's what's really interesting about it, because it's what makes 
going to the International Space Station, going into space so unique is being in this zero-G environment. And yet it's so hard to describe. It's so hard to describe what it is really like. And, and that is something that uh, I have struggled with from my, my first flight back in 2013. And, and even today, it is still hard. And one of the sad things about it, man, is after you come back, it's hard to remember, too, what it's like. You have to go back and look at the videos and see yourself and go, wow, I was really doing that. And, <laughs> and sometimes it's, it's hard to remember what that experience is like, sadly. It, was it really nice to come back and just like drink out of a cup? Were there, were there other things that were just when you returned home that you were so happy to be able to do again, other than, you know, being on Earth and with your families and eating homemade food, that sort of thing? Everything about being back on Earth is <laughs> is good to be able to do. Um, you know, I know I will we'll probably talk about it, but uh, being able to drink out of that open cup, like you said, because, you know, drinking your coffee or in my case, my tea, it's it's an experience, right? It is, it is not just the drinking of the tea. It's the having that nice warm mug, um, having the aroma coming up as well. And you don't, you don't get that in space, right? Because it's all in a bag, you're drinking through a straw. And that's just not quite the same experience as sitting out on your back porch, watching the sun come up with that nice hot, uh, hot mug of tea or coffee. Um, and, and so I would say when, when you get going away, leaving Earth, going up into orbit, one of the things it did for me was make me appreciate every little thing about being back down here on Earth. I mean, I, the week after we returned and I'm sitting on my back porch and you're just sitting there and you're just listening to the wind and you're just listening to the, the sounds of bugs and birds and, and all of those little things that you don't get when, when you're up there on station. And so I appreciate everything about uh, being down here in the, in the 1G environment. Yeah. Yep. Well said. Well said. It was really nice to drink hot coffee out of a mug. It took me about a month to drink coffee on the space station uh, because of the smell. Without the smell, it was a different experience. And so, um, yeah, that's a, that was definitely a, one of the things I've enjoyed about being back on Earth. In addition to just being with my family and being back to normalcy, you know, flying, floating. It was great. It really was. And while I was there, you know, sometimes floating was awesome because you could push off of one side of the module and float as, until you hit something, <laughs> essentially, you know, but it also made things challenging. You'd open a bag and everything wants to come out. And so I used to talk to my family about space Tetris, you know, putting things in a bag has challenges when you're doing it in in weightlessness. And so all those things, though, I, I knew at the time I kept telling myself this won't last forever. And so I tried to enjoy every moment of it. And I did. And, and it is, it's hard to describe because it isn't like anything on, it's like trying, try to describe fire to someone, try to describe fire. It's really complicated to describe fire and get that image into and the smells and the feeling into someone else's head. And so the best thing I can say is floating, living in microgravity and weightlessness is like living the dreams that we have about flying. I mean, when you dream about flying, most of us do, we got to live that for, for almost six months. And that's the best I can tell you because everything else that I could describe is going to attach it to the wrong thing. It's it's got acid. It's kind of like ice skating. How you can keep going for a while, but it's not like ice skating. It's kind of like swimming in terms of being float, being supported. But if, like a hopper said, if you flip upside down in the pool, blood still rushes to your head. Water goes in your nose. So it's not like swimming. It's it's its own thing, and it it uh, was amazing. One more question for you about gravity, and then we'll move on. I know most of our audience is engineers, so I want to get to some of the engineering tech stuff. But um, I watched your launch with my little girls, and, and I think a lot of the nation did. And we were tickled by your choice of zero-G indicators. Can you uh, explain, for those who don't know what a zero-G indicator is and why you chose the one that you did? Uh, yeah, so I mean, zero-G in indicator, the, the uh, tradition of that goes way back. Uh, from from the early days of human spaceflight, and it was uh, you know the idea was just something that was meaningful to the crew that uh, gave you that indication because you're all strapped down that uh, when you get up into into orbit when the engines cut off that yep everything we're really floating we may not be able to experience it because uh, we we uh, still have the the restraints on and all of that kind of stuff but that's just that verification that yep we are we are actually in space. And we are orbiting. And so, you know, for us, um, as you can imagine, uh, most of us are, are space geeks. 
Uh, most of us love uh, the the space type movies and and TV shows, and and certainly uh, Star Wars is one of those that uh, that we enjoyed, and The Mandalorian was one of those that we enjoyed, and and then quite frankly, how can you not love Baby Yoda? I mean, <laughs> so, so it was just one of those things. We had an idea of you know sitting around. Um, in fact, it may have been. Uh, you know, we get together throughout training and uh, we spend a lot of time together uh, throughout training before the mission itself. And so there was just one of those occasions as we're talking about, you know, what do we want to use for a zero G indicator? And, and Baby Yoda came up, uh, Grogu, and and uh, seemed like, you know, everybody was kind of on board with it. So so we went with it. And, mm-hmm. and it was a lot of fun. It's such a great moment because it's this historic flight and you are the first people ever on to crew this capsule from an American, you know, non-government organization. And then out comes this little baby Yoda doll floating around. It was, it was just a really great moment, I think, for everybody watching and I'm sure for you as well. To sh- switch gears a little bit, you both have advanced engineering degrees of, of one type or another. Uh, Mike, you have a master's in aerospace engineering from Stanford. Victor, it looks like you have three master's degrees, flight test engineering, systems engineering, and military operations, art, and science. Um, can you talk about how, wh- why are there so many engineers and so many engineering backgrounds that end up on the space station and in space? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's uh, because there is a need to, the, the, the training that you get in, in, as a neophyte engineer, that academic background, I think it, I can, you can break it down into this simple, these two simple things. It teaches you to critically think and analyze, right? And an- analysis is breaking things down. You can put things into simple, digestible parts, these big complex problems like the space station. Boy, what a crazy animal to try and learn, but we have to learn it so that we can, you know, maintain and also respond in emergencies. But, you know, you learn processes for for breaking things down into simple dig- digestible components, but you also learn synthesis, how to take simple digestible, understandable pieces and put them together as solutions to those problems. And I would say living in microgravity, and I would imagine going to the moon uh, and on to Mars are, is going to be very similar. Living on the International Space Station for 167 days was a continuous riddle to solve. There's always something to, to think about, to do better. I mean, after you know being there for five months as we're preparing to go home, I was still changing my technique for doing blood draws and, and other things that I can talk about later. But you're constantly you're constantly competing against weightlessness and against yourself and trying to be better and to use the space station uh, as, as effectively as you can. And so engineering and STEM science, those backgrounds all I think are important at giving you a mental framework for handling these complex things. And so, you know, I talk about training for the space station. I think that that educational rigor is very important. Uh, not only one, you prove that you have the, the the stuff to do this job and handle it, even though it's not the most technical thing in the world. Uh, you do have that background, but it also gives you a foundation for going up there and being effective and efficient on the space station. Mike, uh, similar question for you. You were the mission commander. Can you describe what roles were uniquely yours as the commander and how did you think through when a problem popped up the mindsets and the skills of, of your different crewmates, how to, how to tackle these problems that, that might pop up that you didn't expect? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question, Dan. And, um, you know, I think one of the, the, the first ways to answer that is we had an amazing crew. And, and so what that allowed was uh, as the commander, I didn't have to come up with all the solutions uh, because everybody on the crew uh, from uh, you know, myself and Victor and Shannon and Suichi, all of them had, um, you know, great backgrounds, great experience. And, and so um, the way we kind of divided the duties and, and Victor and I actually, you know, we had an opportunity to start training together much earlier than uh, with Shannon and with Suichi because they came a little bit later. And so we had kind of broke down the, the duties, if you will, on uh, on Crew Dragon between myself as commander. I kind of took care of uh, looking at the crew, looking at the timeline, looking at the mission. And, and then Victor was responsible for the vehicle. He was responsible for all the systems, tracking those. And, and so 
you know, with him doing that and, and me kind of trying to, to – and Victor was always keeping the big picture in mind as well – uh, but uh, that really helped us manage all of the, the different scenarios. And I got to tell you, probably one of my favorite moments during training, which I think gets to kind of where your question was was going. We were in a sim and we were in a uh, it was a rendezvous and docking sim. And we were at the uh, the point, the 20 meter hold point. And there were some uh, some issues with uh, I think it was the camera system on board. And so we, we go into a hold there and uh, the ground team calls up and says, hey, we're going to we need to spend some time talking about this. And, and so we had some time, of course, on board as well that we're analyzing the situation and we're thinking about uh, what what we're going to do next. And and it was amazing because all I said was, OK, we're going to Mark Watney this. So if you've seen The Martian and, and Mark Watney, I said, we're just going to, you know, you, you look at the first problem first and then you, you solve that and you go on to the next, et cetera. That is all I said. And then all of a sudden, I think it was Shannon mentioned something and that triggered something from Ike, which triggered something from Suichi. And then all of a sudden we had a plan of attack and we called that down to the ground and when we called that down to the ground, we had thought of some things that they hadn't had an opportunity to think of yet. And that was probably, I, I would say for all of us, one of the, the most special moments during training. I think probably for all of us, one of the most proudest moments of our training is because, again, it was us coming together as a crew. It was not one single person having to come up with all of the, the answers. And, and I think from an engineering standpoint, from a problem solving standpoint, that is the way to do it. I was kind of hoping you were going to say you were going to start growing potatoes on your on your sim, but um, <laughs> that sounds like a more useful solution. <laughs> um, what about if, if something a, goes that's wrong? That's a later story. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, we won't go there. Um, so if something I'm thinking through how the potatoes were grown, but I think that might be out of scope for this conversation. Um, if, if something goes wrong up in space, you know, I, I imagine like inner space shipping is really expensive and complicated. What do you do when you need a part? You know, like you said, getting things to space is expensive. We do send up things on cargo vehicles and we try to spare out but we have to think about it in a smart way. It's expensive to get things up there. And so you just can't have an, an unlimited store of things, but you need to have a certain amount. And so, and, and then there are also consumables, things that we just go through at a certain rate. And so ma managing all that, we have an, a flight control position and then backroom support. There's so much work to do in that, trying to manage what things you keep on, on station. So we do sometimes have spare parts. We have a, a surplus of some things, we also have the ability, but right now it's mostly a technology demonstration and then a manufacturing demonstration. It's not really an operational uh, system yet, but we have additive manufacturing. We have 3D printing capability on the space station, and we've used it to make a tool and to make parts. But mostly right now we're making things that are visually representative that we take pictures of so the ground team can analyze the quality of these productions. Uh, but eventually that will be a way as well. But you, there's always the, the 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 human in the machine. You know, you have people there that uh, in, in a pinch can can innovate, you know, and it's amazing what you can do with, you know, a couple feet of rubber tubing, uh, uh, the right tools, some scissors and duct tape. And we sometimes have had to, to innovate and make, um, you know, solve problems on the spot. And so sometimes that's the way you do it as well. We had a, a small device we used to, to check for combustion products. So if we think there was a fire, it's a small pump that pulls uh, air over the, the sensor. And so that pump had broken on while we were in space. And when I opened it up, the tubing inside, had, had it's so old, it was starting to just crack be uh, because of age. And so we actually took, uh, you were talking about growing vegetables or growing potatoes, but we, you know, we grow vegetables in space. And one of the ways we do that is these big bags of water and they have rubber tubes on them. And actually I had to ask Mike for one of those and he was using it to water our plants on, in space, but I needed to cut a section of it off to replace this tubing. And thankfully they were similar diameters and we were able to, you know, it was a repair that hopefully isn't permanent. We'll fly up a new system because it's important. This was a piece of emergency equipment. But that tubing was uh, enough to to get that device back working and operational because we only had two on the station, one in the Russian segment, one in the U.S. segment. And so now we had or at least while we were there, we at least had one that could function. 
Uh, and so sometimes you have to make it uh, with what you have. Yeah. Uh, question for both of you then, and Mike, we'll start with you. What Are there any moments that you are especially proud of that you'd like to geek out with with other engineers, but maybe it didn't make a, like a NASA a press brief or, or headlines or anything like that? Are any of those moments that stand out for you? Well, you know, I, I obviously he mentioned one one situation that uh, he was able to solve a, a problem. Um, you, you know, kind of bigger picture from a geek out standpoint, engineering standpoint. Uh, the and, and a lot of this, in fact, most of it was before Ike and I had even gotten there. But from an engineering standpoint, when you think about the International Space Station, none of the major components were ever tested together before they got to space. So none of the modules, none of the trusses, none of that was actually bolted together and made sure everything is aligned, all the holes are right, all of that kind of stuff, all of the electrical cables were the right length. None of that happened on the ground. All of that happened up in space. And so even though um, Ike and I never contributed to that actual building of the space station, every time I'm up there and I see that and, and I see some of the problems that we ran into, while we're up there, it is truly amazing that that the space station even exists in, in its current form because of the, the engineering that made that happen. Absolutely. And then from the other area where I think, in my mind, there, I mean, there's so much engineering on board. There's so many places that you can geek out. But one of my favorite areas of geeking out is when you're doing spacewalks, the EVAs, the extravehicular activities. And, and so, you know, this, the things like the, the pistol grip tool that we use, the PGT, our cordless drill, I mean, that thing is an engineering marvel because it has to be able to go outside. Um, it has to be able to work from, uh, you know, in this plus 200, minus 200 environments, you know, as you're orbiting around the earth, uh, it's got to be able to last for six and a half, seven and a half hours while you're out there. Oh, and at the same time, you've got to be able to operate it with this big, you know, your ski gloves on. That are that are hard to squeeze and all of those kind of things. So there's those tools that that are amazing and how they happen. And then when we go out on these spacewalks, oftentimes you have to just come up with some tools um, that uh, that don't exist. And and so you're you're kludging together different pieces and parts that are on board station because you've got to, you know, you got to go out the door and you got to fix this thing. And and uh, and so when you get to see the, and, and this is a team effort because it is someone, you know, thinking, hey, we've got this tool, can we use it? And someone else says, yeah, what if we combine those two together? And, and literally you'll see going out the door for spacewalks, tools that have been put together with tape, with uh, wire ties, and, and you're going out and you're fixing a $100 billion space station with these tools and it works. Yeah. And so from geeking out on engineering, I would say the, the spacewalk piece of it is, is one that I really get excited about. And, and the, a number of solutions that they've come up with over the years to get the job done is, is truly impressive. I'm happy to hear that my excessive use of zip ties and duct tape to hold things together is uh, space and NASA approved. Uh, Victor, is there anything that, anything that stands out to you other than the, the tube? I know you shared the, the pump already. Uh, any other moments, engineers that would just you know that that was yeah. definitely that. Was, yeah, oh, that right. that was a fun one. Um, it was a little pet project, and I enjoyed doing that. And I was trying to take pictures for the folks on the ground along the way, and that so that that whole adventure was was a good one. But you know, like like Hopper said, the big picture. There are so many technical things. The technology in the suits, you know. People look at those and think of them as a suit, but it's also important to remember it is a spacecraft. It has a propulsion system, a life support so system on the inside, uh, visor that you're looking at. I mean, it's it's a spaceship uh, that, that can fly you around if, if need be in extremis. And it's pretty amazing when you think about all the things that it does, uh, including the communication that we don't have to hit buttons for. We just talk and we can communicate with each other on the ground. But I would say one of the things that I found uh, from a problem solving perspective to be the most uh, enjoyable, I guess, is um, the problems that we, we had challenges that showed up. You know, some of them were on spacewalks, like Hopper said. But it was when we would attack them like that sim he mentioned earlier, where we had a, a solution on board and then we worked with the ground and the ground had a piece of the solution. And it was when we all together came up with pieces of it that the final answer was some amalgamation of all of those pieces. Hopper and I were working on 
a valve installation. We were doing inner module valves uh, to a new module or a new section of the space station yeah. because we had put a new airlock on the NanoRacks airlock and we were outfitting these. And I mean, think of every kind of problem you can have. This thing ain't long enough to get to there. This won't fit in this orientation like it's supposed to be that, you know, it just there were there were lots of little issues for us to address. And we did. He, we, we Mark Watney did. We did it one by one and we addressed them and we we got through them. And uh, it was some onboard effort, some on the ground effort. Uh, and the flight control team, you know, did a lot to be applauded. And so that like at the end of it, I actually went and wrote a note home to my family. Like it felt really good to do that problem solving. I mean, between Earth and space, like it's pretty amazing because you don't always see everything that's going on in space. So just trying to understand or communicate what's going on in space can be a challenge. And so to get to the end of that, there were moments in the middle where I thought we're going to end this and, and, and not have success. And so to cross the finish line and actually have been able to install those and that they work was, uh, was, was quite uh, an accomplishment. It felt great. So you've both mentioned spacewalks. Um, Mike, you've done a, a few and you, you together spent over 20 hours on spacewalks together. Can you talk about just the general feelings and emotions that you have as you go into a spacewalk, especially in a situation where you think it might not work? Because, you know, after doing three total in 160 days, it's not like you just hop out the next day and take another stab at it. <laughs> You know, spacewalks are, they are, um, it's almost like floating, right? It's its hard to to describe every kind of emotion that's that's happening when you're going out the door on a, on a spacewalk, when you're going out that hatch. Um, you know, as you can imagine, you're very excited. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, most astronauts, if not all of them, is, is something that they want to do sometime in their in their career. And so to be able to do that is is pretty special. Uh, so you're also very focused uh, because the last thing you want to do when you go out on a spacewalk is lose a tool or or you. Um, so you, you're very focused on on making sure everything is tethered and making sure everything is is where it's supposed to be. And at the same time, you're very nervous, right? And and that's understandable as well. You're going out into a very harsh environment, and as Victor said, uh, you're going out in this little spaceship, this little spacecraft. And, and that's what's standing between you and, uh, and an environment you're not going to survive if, if it fails. And, and so as you could, you are, you are somewhat nervous. Um, you have to be. I, I just, I can't imagine somebody going out the door on that and not having a, a little bit of, uh, of, uh, uh, you know, butterflies in their stomach and, and that kind of thing. Uh, it would be, I, I would be very impressed if someone, I don't know how many spacewalks you'd have to do to have it become so commonplace to you that, that you're not uh, a little bit worried when, when you're going out the door. Um, and, and so that piece of it is very challenging. And, I, you know, it was interesting because for me, you know, I did two spacewalks on my first mission and then uh, was, was fortunate to go out the door with Ike for three on this mission. And one of the big differences that, that really helped me this time around um, versus the first time around. And the, the, the first time, you, know, you got a lot of time just to get out the door. You're spending five and a half, six hours getting suited, doing the pre-breathe, getting your tools on, getting the airlock down to vacuum. That's a lot of time to sit there and think about what's coming up and, and what you're getting ready to do. And, and it's very easy to, uh, to, to psych yourself out be, because you spend so much time. And so this time I took a, a little bit different approach and it really helped me. Uh, and that was, I'm just taking it one step at a time. And I'm only going to be worried about this next step. And that next step might be I'm putting on my pre-breathe mask and I'm going to sit here for, for 60 minutes doing this pre-breathe. But I'm not worrying about anything else, but just making sure that I, uh, I go through this pre-breathe step. And when it's done, I'm going to go to the next step. And when that's done, I'm going to go to the next one. And, and that just kept all of those other thoughts that, uh, that can lead you down a bad path, that kept them out of my mind. And, and then the next thing you know, uh, you're coming in the door six and a half, seven hours later, and you've you've completed it. And uh, and, and so that really that was uh, one of the ways for me this time around that it, it made uh, a big difference in, in how um, I just felt in terms of, of going out the door and executing that piece of the mission. Yeah. Victor, what was it like to have someone who's done it before kind of walking you through 
yeah. in real life what that's like. It, it was great. You know, it was, I was very fortunate to have my first two spacewalks with Mike because we had done so much work on the ground. And so that one piece of familiarity when I was going into this environment that was totally new, even though the one, the training systems on the ground in the neutral buoyancy lab we have here, they're f- phenomenal. It's still, it, there's no way to really prepare for going out into the real vacuum of space with nothing holding it up. I mean, it's all in orbit with you. And so it just, it looks different. It looks similar to the one we train on. But so having that voice and, the, and, and, and my, you know, working with Mike, we don't always even have to say the things. We just kind of know how each other works and we go to go do the thing. And so that piece of familiarity helped. Uh, and, and Mike hit it on, on the head, you know, focusing on one thing at a time. So I remember very vividly my very first spacewalk and he opens the hatch and goes out. And then when I went out the hatch, I said, I'm not going to look down. I'm not going out the spacewalk. I'm going out to work. I'm going out to space work. And so I went out the hatch and I was looking at my hands. And then when it came, when I got out, I was looking at him. I checked him over. He checked me over. And then we went to work. He headed out and I had to put this big box on my suit and then go get on the robotic arm, which was another unique. Ch- so anyway, it was taking things one step at a time and being able to just quiet the mind and focus on that one thing. If you read Tom Wolf's uh, The Right Stuff, It's not about these fighter jocks that are able to just go light their hair on fire and do anything. It's they they recognize the challenges ahead of them and they're just able to work through it. They have those feelings and those emotions and they're able to still focus and do the right thing. They're able to work through it. And that is I was focused on that. I just wanted to do one thing at a time. I know this handrail goes where I'm going one handrail at a time. And uh, and and that even by the end of it. So I got to do four spacewalks total, three of them with Mike. And on our last one, our very last spacewalk was the most challenging, in my opinion. It was lots of little tasks instead of, you know, one or two big tasks. And so we had finished up. He went one way and I went the other. And uh, we actually we had gone to do a task together with the ammonia line venting and then taking that jumper off. But then we split up and did a separate set of tasks. And at the beginning of that second task, wrestling that jumper we had this big ammonia hose that i had to curl around a bag and then bring it back and it was like a college i wrestled in college it was like a college wrestling match trying to do that in (laughs) microgravity outside the space station and so by the time i got back to the airlock to get ready for the second uh activity my hands were just worn out they were completely tired and and i had the lactic acid burn going and i'm sitting at the airlock which is like home and safety and the, it's light in there all the time you know and i'm thinking to myself i just want to crawl in there and stay and i said uh we're only a few hours couple hours into it we got a long way to go and then i went you know what nope i only have to do this next thing i have to get that bag in there and then get this bag out and i just focused on that and i actually had to do that that entire spacewalk the rest of that spacewalk and it ended, if you remember this, Mike, it ended with us tying down that real bag. That was the very last activity. And it sounds really simple. There are two of us out there, like you said, a bunch of education between us, degrees, training, tests, and all this flying fighters. And the last thing we had to do in the vacuum of space was tie down a bag. And it took every ounce of <laughs> mental and physical strength I had. But I can tell you this, if Mike wasn't there and we weren't talking to each other, wouldn't have been able to do it. So it took all that capability and a teammate. And and it, w- it was at the end of the spacewalk. It was night. The sun had just gone down and it was just a really challenging moment. But again, we just did one thing at a time. You hold this, yeah. hook that. Okay, now we can unhook this. You got it. I've got that. Okay, we're and we tied it down. I mean, painstaking step by painstaking step. Uh, but I was tired. And, uh, you know, one of the things about that spacesuit that doesn't get much airtime is, he told you we spend hours before we get in it and then we're in it for six to seven hours outside the space station. So for that, you know, period of, you know, there's about 10 hours or so where all you have available to you is 32 ounces of water. And so your brain is at a, is at a calorie shortage. You're a little hypoglycemic at that point. And, and uh, that's the time when you have to do the most important things though, is at the end, get back inside. So you've both talked a lot about focusing on what's very next right in front of you, but I want to look a little farther out now. Uh, The NASA Artemis program sounds incredibly exciting, sending people to the moon for the first time since 1972 um, out of low Earth orbit, the first time out of low Earth orbit with the first 
first launch of that coming, I think, in November 2021. So that's coming up. Can you speak a little bit about, uh, Mike, we'll start with you, about what it means to pursue sending astronauts to the moon again? Yeah, I, I think, um, as you said, it's, it's extremely exciting, extremely exciting time. And and what I, th there's a couple things I like about, um, what to think about in terms of, you know, from an astronaut's perspective, and then maybe something a little bit more global. And so from an astronaut's perspective, uh, when you sit there and think about having an opportunity to go somewhere where you know no one else has ever been before, that, that when you put your foot down at this point, you are going to be the only person that has ever put your foot down at that point. That, I mean, that is something that just, man, I, I, I'm getting goosebumps here sitting and think about what it would be like to have that opportunity. Uh, but but now just kind of let, let's step back and, and I want to think more globally, more not just from a personal standpoint, but what it means for, for us as a nation, what it means for us as a world, what it means for us as humanity. You know, my, my uh, youngest son is 20 years old. He has never known a time when there has not been a U.S. astronaut orbiting this earth. And, and that's pretty incredible. I mean, for, for us to, you know, we grew up when, you know, you had the shuttle flights to be up for two weeks and then they come back. And, and, and so to sit there and think about him not knowing any time when there is not an astronaut orbiting this earth is, is pretty amazing. And so what, what Artemis, what this first flight that you're talking about uh, happening, uh, hopefully in, in November or December of this year, that is the beginning of a time where we could have someone on the moon, someone on Mars, and future generations are never going to know a time when we don't have someone on the moon or on Mars. And so just think what that means, right? I mean, it, we, we, we sometimes take it as commonplace that, that uh, you know, there's somebody orbiting the Earth right now, that, you know, seven of our, of our colleagues are up there orbiting the Earth right now. Uh, and, and so this is the beginning stages of, of making that a reality as well, that, that there's going to be a time when there's always someone uh, on the moon and always someone on Mars. And that, to me, is extremely exciting. Victor, how about you? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the goals of the Artemis program, and, and uh, I'm really excited about one facet of it in particular. And Hopper just went into the, 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 fine, the bigger points of it, but the fact that we're going to stay, that we're going to have a sustained presence of some sort, I think that's really important. And, uh, and, and I am looking forward to whatever piece of it that we get to do, whether it's, you know, sitting in mission control, talking to the crew that's on the way to the moon or sitting in a meeting and helping uh, think through the problems that could arise and how we'll tackle them. You know, all of us have a shot at, at being some part of this uh, team effort. And I'm, I'm just excited to be here at this time. It is a great time to be in the space business. So obviously an incredibly special time. Um, is there anything you'd like to say to your higher ups who might be watching about why they should choose you? <laughs> you know, if that's all it took, uh, things, things would look different. All of us would probably be in space right now. You know, no, I, yeah, I, might I think uh, they, okay. what they're using to decide has already been determined, right? The, the work's already been done. So, you know, their minds are made up in that regard. But uh, yeah, we're here. That's all yeah. we can do is be here for them. For sure. Can you talk about some of the new, I know there's some new cutting edge technologies going into the Orion spacecraft and the space launch system. Can one of you speak to kind of how that's going to work and some of the techno technological advances that went into making this reality? Go for it. You know, so I I'll, I can talk to a few of, of the things, but I also want to, you know, put this in tension with this other idea that there are also some proven technologies that are going into it, which I think are really important. You know, the the, the rocket that's going to power this system. So Artemis is made up of all these ground systems, which there's a whole lot of. Then there's the rocket, which is SLS, the Space Launch System, and the spacecraft that people are going to be in uh, is called uh, Orion. And then there's a, a lunar gateway that uh, is, is, they don't like us to call it a space station around the moon. 
but it's kind of like a space station on the moon. Uh, and so uh, all of those pieces uh, and then uh, lots of other little science payloads, they call them co-manifested payloads that are going to be on the rocket that can come out in different times and go into different orbits. And so this system ha- is, is, is powered by the, the solid rocket boosters that are similar to what flew on the shuttle. In fact, the technology, the hardware we're going to fly for the first missions is, I think, four missions. We have four missions worth of boosters that are going to fly. And then we have, uh, I'm sorry, that's maybe the, uh, the RS-25 engines. But those engines that are on the bottom of the core stage are the same technology that, that powered the space shuttle. It had three of them on the back of the shuttle. There are four on the bottom of the core booster, uh, and those are going to, you know, uh, it's going to sound and smell very much like a shuttle launch when this thing launches. And when it launches, it'll be the most powerful rocket uh, to, to, to fly. It, uh, it's, it's, it's on the order of eight and a half million pounds of thrust. The only lift capability that could get a, a human rated class spacecraft like Orion to orbit around the moon. And so, yes, there's a bunch of new things that are coming out. If you look at Orion, it looks very much like uh, the Apollo spacecraft. Uh, it looks very much like the, the Starliner. It looks, none of them are as sleek as Crew Dragon. Resilience is the best looking one, in my opinion. But uh, they're all roughly the same. Physics has determined that. The teardrop shape, that's physics. Physics says this works best on entry. Uh, and so, and it also happens to work in the aerodynamic environment of going uphill for ascent, but it's really about entry in the thermal, di- the thermal uh, environment you come into uh, with the heating. So, the technology that's going into it, though, it's all brand new. It's, you know, we've got better computer processing than we did during Apollo days. We've got better understanding of the thermal system. So the, the heat shield on the Orion uh, and the thermal protection system on the uh, uh, SLS rocket, you know, there's all kinds of new technology going into that. But another thing that's also important is not just the technology. There's technology in this new system and there are, you know, these proven pieces and then there's also manufacturing that's bringing them together. And some of these things are being stuck together with new manufacturing technology. So that's another piece, I think, that doesn't get enough talk in these tech spaces that sometimes you're not making a new thing. You're making the same thing or an old thing in a new way. And one of the technologies that uh, we're using to manufacture, to manufacture some of this new space hardware is like friction stir welding. The FAA has recently approved F- friction stir welding for aircraft. And so you're seeing... The aircraft industry embraced this technology as well. And so we're using it uh, to make spacecraft. And so it's a much faster way, but also a much more like almost down to the like uh, atomic level way to fuse two pieces of metal. And so friction stir welding is a technology that is helping us to make things better, not just make new things, but to make things better. Yeah, one of the things I think is exciting about uh, from a new technology standpoint, uh, you know, Victor talked a lot about the things that are going to get us there. Uh, but one of the things I think is exciting is about uh, when you get there, the in-situ resource utilization that's going to have to happen, that's going to make uh, these missions possible. And and so that's that's something we really, I mean, I guess we do it in the sense of like we're in space station right now, we utilize the sun to get our power and things of that nature. But uh, when we talk about taking advantage of the water that's on the moon and taking advantage of the resources that are on Mars to enable these missions, um, I, I think that's uh, another area that is is extremely exciting with uh, from a from an engineering from a technology development standpoint. Can you talk a little more about the advantages of being on the moon and and being on Mars versus being in a microgravity environment of space, Mike? Well, I think the the big advantage um, of like the moon, for example, you know, we have this goal, and and I think it's the right goal of eventually getting to Mars, but. Uh, the moon, not only is it, uh, is it a, a great place for us to learn about, uh, you know, our earth moon uh, environment that we live in, uh, but it's also going to be that proving ground for going on to Mars. And, and so the idea of being able to test out um, these systems, these in-situ resource utilization, to be able to do all of that in a location where home is not far away if something goes really bad. And, and so I think that is the, the advantage and the reason for uh, one of the big reasons, I should say, for, for going to the moon is just being able to, to do that. And, and then the Mars, uh, you know, again, we're, we're going to be we're going to get there and, and we're going to learn about our solar system. We're going to learn about the universe and, and where it all started. And so I think that's also um, uh, something that is, uh, is a, a, a reason to go. Great. 
So we only have a couple minutes left, so I want to sneak in some questions, uh, you know, from our audience and, and from from the team here. Um, maybe some hot takes that aren't. I don't know if they're officially NASA sanctioned. I don't know if you can say that or not. But um, we got to start with billionaires in space, <laughs> right? That's been all over the news, yeah. and the FAA just changed their uh, guidance for what an a- astronaut is. So is Jeff Bezos an astronaut or not? What What are your thoughts on that, Victor? We'll start with you. Put you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if you if you ask him, he's going to say yes, and that's probably the most important uh, part of that answer is is he's going to say yes. Um, but you know, I, I think when I when I start talking about this stuff with folks, I I think first of all, all space space exploration that's safe and reliable that gets them up there, allows them to do whatever their mission is and get back safely, is important. All space is good space. And I think, you know, I, we're not allowed to work with the Chinese space agencies, but I think what they're doing is awesome as long as they're pushing the ball forward. And and, uh, and I think it's important that we keep safety at the forefront. So all these activities, is, as long as they're learning the lessons that we've learned, sometimes at the cost of, of blood and sweat and tears and, and human life, as long as we keep those things in mind. So, you know, when I think about Jeff Bezos, or more so Richard Branson, before he flew, but there were Virgin Galactic uh, employees that had flown to space. And in, in trying to reach that goal of eventually getting them into space, uh, whatever lines, people want to talk about what line, you know, Branson went to this line, Bezos went to this line, we lived at this line. And, and it's not a competition. It's a system where all of those pieces, they work together well. But before those things happen for these space tourism companies, Virgin Galactic, they got that system developed by a, a company called Scale Composites. And scaled composites uh, created the, the the mothership and the spaceship. And there was a test going on back in, I believe it was 2015. Uh, and they had a mishap. And on the way, the, the, sp- the rocket dropped and lit the motor. And as it was going uphill, they unfeathered and the spacecraft opened up. And it was still under propulsion and it ripped in half. One of the pilots was injured. The other one died. That pilot that died, his name was Mike Osbury. And Mike Osbury went to Cal Poly like I did at the same time that I did. And so when people start talking about lines, I think about he and his family. I think about him and his family. Uh, he didn't make it to space. He didn't make it to space. Uh, but he moved the ball significantly forward. He opened doors that enable all of this stuff that everybody's talking about. But nobody's talking about Mike. But the Astronaut Memorial Foundation recently voted that they're going to put his name on the Astronaut Memorial. And I think that that speaks volumes about the work he did and about the astronaut community and, and so, you know, that's what's important, I think, is that he was doing work to move the ball forward, to open doors to these new opportunities. And so Virgin Galactic's mission, I applaud what they've done, what Sir Richard Branson was able to accomplish and what Jeff Bezos and his team have been able to accomplish is amazing. It's inspiring and not the soft, fuzzy inspiring, but the inspiring that helps people make decisions, that helps our politician give resources to NASA and NOAA and allows us to let contracts with these partners to keep moving the ball forward and to create a, a future that's going to work for all of us. So so I applaud what they've done. And if Jeff Bezos wants to call himself an astronaut, guess what we're going to call him? <laughs> the man with the <laughs> coins rules. He, he's going to be called an astronaut. And so, Fair enough. but I tell you this, if Jeff Bezos, if Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Hopper, and I go on a mission, I think the two of them, they're going to say, you guys tell us what to do because they know what we do. And I think they respect our profession, especially given their recent experiences. They know how hard it was to do what they've done. Jeff Bezos required on a very highly trained, proficient ground team and a great set of uh, hardware and software. Richard Branson had all those same things. And he also had pilots in the spacecraft and in the mothership that dropped them. So I think their experience has given them a heightened awareness of the importance of having a trained and proficient team, no matter what their job title is. Call them a passenger astronaut. Call us NASA astronauts. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, we're all trying to do our best work to enable human space exploration and support the next generation. Thank you so much. Words of wisdom for sure. Mike, You, since we're talking about titles and nomenclature a little bit, last question as we're running out of time. You were the first U.S. member of the U.S. Space Force to be in space. And I, I believe you swore in to the U.S. Space Force while on the space station. Can you describe astronaut versus guardian and kind of what why the space force exists and what what the purpose is behind all that 
Yeah, I mean, that was uh, that was quite an honor to, you know, to have that opportunity to transition from the Air Force, uh, a, a career that I've loved, a service that I've loved to be a part of for 27, over 27 years, and, and uh, to be able to transition into the to the Space Force from space with uh, General Raymond, the, the Chief of Space Operations there. That was uh, a very, very special moment for me. Um, I think one of the uh, the interesting parts about it was it gave us an opportunity as well to highlight the, the different missions between the U.S. Space Force and, and NASA, because I think it's easy to confuse the two and think we're, we're one and the same, and, and the reality is that we're not. There's certainly a uh, you know, we overlap in the same environment, but, uh, you know, NASA is about the peaceful exploration of space and, and uh, the U.S. Space Force is about assuring that that can happen and making sure that we continue to have access to space and that, uh, um, and that we can do so, um, the United States and our allies can continue to operate up in space. And so very distinct missions. And uh, and so I think that was an, a great opportunity to be able to highlight the difference between those missions and at the same time highlight that there is a lot of collaboration that that does happen between our, our organizations. And, and so very special to, to be able to do that. Still working on Ike. I uh, got to get him to transfer <laughs> over, but uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. I got <laughs> fly Navy. <laughs> That's right. Hey, when I have Navy pilots in my family. Team, call me. <laughs> so any any parting words of exhortation or advice for engineers listening to this to this episode now uh victor any any closing remarks that you'd like to to share with engineers Can I? please uh, how, i was gonna say hopper is, is our is our our sage he's gonna really give some deep wisdom so can i go first with okay. my one easy one if, is that okay sounds Commander? great all right. Now, I, I just want to encourage. So, since our you know audience is mostly technical engineering, probably also management and, and C-suite folks and stuff, but but in a technical sense, I think those of us in the science and technology workforce have to think about some things. Early in our careers, we develop these reputations and technical competence, and that's important. But at some point, leadership and management becomes very important. I think those cannot be overemphasized. Those are vital. And one other thing that I think we are not very good at that we have to focus on and really Make sure, because it's a key component to inspiring the next generation of the science and, technolo and technology workforce, is our ability to communicate and to share what we do and to communicate in a way that's captivating. Uh, when we didn't fly the space shuttle for a decade, I used to tell people our job in the astronaut corps, one important job is to catch the heart. The space shuttle launch used to do that. It would make people go home and read encyclopedias about thermal protection and propulsion and the emissions. And, and now we didn't have the launches doing that. And so it's our job to captivate the heart. And then we can talk about all the technical pieces. And so please take take this piece about storytelling and communicating the challenges and the rewards of our professions to, to young people, especially seriously, because I think it's our job to replace ourselves. And we can only do that if we inspire those young kids. Well, I'm not going to go second anymore. I, <laughs> I it's the last time you're going to go first. <laughs> he pulled a fast one on you there. That, that was good. Hey, no, though, I, I will say because, um, you know, for all the engineers that are, that are going to watch this, um, I, I'd like to say thank you. Because uh, it is the engineers, um, the scientists, the the thousands, tens of thousands of people on on the ground that have made what I can I do possible. That have allowed us to to go uh, up into space and and uh, and try and further uh, human exploration. Uh, but I would also say, you know, I talked about inspiring the next generation, and I would say that uh, for these uh, the engineers out there, we need you now more than ever. Uh, we need I mean, we are not going to get to the moon. We are not going to go on to Mars without them. And, and so what they are doing is so critically important. And it's not only critically important, as I mentioned, for space exploration, but it's also critically important for just taking care of our own planet, taking care of Earth. And, you know, we have a lot of challenges and it's going to take engineers to solve those challenges. And so, uh, again, thank you and uh, look forward to working with you uh, in, the, in the future. Yes, thank you. Well, Victor and Mike, thank you so much for being here. And thanks again to Avnet for sponsoring today's keynote. Visit their website at avnet.com. 
This and the other Industry Tech Days keynotes are available with a video stream as well over on allaboutcircuits.com, so go check those out. Also, all of the Industry Tech Days streaming sessions are available there on demand. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff. Next week, we'll be back in the studio, but this time with people who have won an Oscar and an Emmy. You'll never guess who it is, and I'm sure not going to spoil the surprise. You'll have to find out next time.